Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I am very excited to be here today with Bible teacher, speaker, and author, Shadia Harishi. Um, she's written a lot of different books. She's got this series called Behind the Scene, Exploring the Bible's Unsung Heroes. And the book that we're going to talk about right now is um, Rahab, Rediscovering the God Who Saves Me. So Shadia, thank you so much for being here. Oh my goodness. It's my honor. Thank you for having me. Well, before we get started, I would love to jump in, but I just want to know what is your favorite prayer closet? What, what is the place that you go to meet with God? Oh, so I have a favorite living room chair <laughs> and, um, it overlooks, um, my back patio. So I actually can, um, sometimes I have lights out there and I'll turn on the lights and, um, I put on usually, um, instrumental worship music and my coffee and my, I'm a very much of a creature, a habit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've got my coffee. I got my warm blanket on my favorite chair and my Bible and my journal and, and just quiet. And, and that, like I said, I like that instrumental worship music in the background. You uh -huh. Or sometimes I'll play a podcast of like just singing birds like I'll do that. Oh, too. that is so neat. Yeah. Just kind yeah. of bring the, bring the nature into yeah. our time with God. Yeah. I have a prayer chair also, and I, I definitely know, you know, what it's like to have that area and that space. And I think there's brain science that really attests to the fact that when you have these triggers, it helps you get into the mindset of what you're doing more quickly. Because I mean, prayer and meditation and Bible reading I mean, there can be so many distractions. So the more ways that you can set yourself up for success, the better, I think. So, yeah, that's yeah, really I agree. Yeah. And I'd like to do it early in the morning when it's still very quiet. Yeah. yeah. And I'm also team coffee. We've got some tea. Yes. <laughs> oh, team, yeah. I got to have my cold coffee. <laughs> drinks, but I'm, I'm with you. Coffee and Bible study just really yeah. go together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I would love to know what inspired you to write this whole series on unsung heroes of the Bible. And then also why specifically Rahab for this next book that you've written? Yeah. So, um, you know, the series is really, like you said, it's, it's the unsung heroes. Um, there's, you know, we're, we're so often familiar with kind of what we call the heroes of the faith, you mm -hmm. know, like Abraham and Moses and, uh, and we look up to them and so forth, but I'm just really attracted to kind of the, I don't know, the backstory people and the ones who, you know, just, you know, had a lot going against them. Um, I think I'm attracted to them because I have, you know, a lot of mistakes in my past. Um, I, I often call my books the kind of the messy stories in the Bible. Like I just like the messy stories, the messy people, because um, I can relate to them. And I love how when God steps in, there's always redemption um, every single time because God is who he is. Um, and then, so that, so that was kind of this, the inspiration for the series. Um, well, Rahab, excuse me, Hagar was the first one I wrote. And that's kind of where the subtitle for the series came in, this whole play on words behind the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those listening, we spell scene S-E-E-N. It's not a typo. <laughs> and uh, just that beauty of how God is always working behind the scene in each of our lives as well. So that was kind of the inspiration for the series. And then uh, Rahab um, was, is the latest study. So this, it's the fourth in the series. I wrote it after I finished uh, Tamar. Um, she was the first in the lineage of Christ that I had written on. And I was like, oh, what are we going to do next? Well, we got to do Rahab, you know. <laughs> um, both of their stories are tainted by prostitution. Um, and so that's just another thing that weaves them together. And again, another element of that messiness um, that I just like so much. I think it's beautiful that God uses these messy stories to teach us something beautiful about who he is. Well, it's such a gift because if everything was just polished and perfect, none of us would feel like we were like we had a shot at yeah, redemption, exactly. you know, there would be yeah, nothing to right. be redeemed from. It's like, oh, exactly. well, I guess they're all well and good, but what a gift to be able to relate yeah. to these people and these women specifically um, who had tainted pasts and God chose them, you know, in some cases like Rahab to be in the lineage of Jesus. I mean, what greater honor. So, yeah. 
Um, well, I loved this. One of my favorite stories that you share is you're talking about this time where you were at a writer's conference and you were invited by the speaker to, to pray boldly about something. Can you share that story and that experience? Yeah. So, so that was a number of years back. It was just, um, I had, um, I was at a writer's conference and I had finished writing the Hagar manuscript and it was in the process of being published. It wasn't even actually out yet. It was going to come out later that year. And uh, at this writer's conference, the speaker um, challenged us as authors and writers to pray, pray a bold prayer. Um, and it was kind of, you know, left a little bit vague, you know, and, you know, I know some were thinking, you know, pray, you know, numbers or sales or ministry impact. And, and, you know, those are all fine. But when I, you know, being kind of fairly new at all of it, um, I remember, you know, going to bed that night because that that, that um, talk was given at the beginning of the retreat. It was like a Friday night. And um, and I was like, gosh, I don't know you know, what would I do with the bold prayer? You know, so I was just kind of chewing on it and I went to sleep and then I woke up really early, like, un, you know, unnormally early, I don't know, 4 a.m. or something like that. And I couldn't go back to sleep. So I just thought, all right, well, you know, you're at a retreat, enjoy it. So get up. So the first thing I did was make my coffee. <laughs> Even at the retreat center, I was like so thankful there was a coffee pot in the room. So I made a cup of coffee and I pulled the blanket off the bed and I sat out. There was this tiny little kind of balcony out there. and um you know, it's still dark, you know, but, um, I could hear the birds chirping a little bit and, you know, the sun was just coming up and you didn't even I'm need like, the podcast because you had the, the birds. <laughs> I had the real thing. Um, I mean, it was a sweet moment, but it, but part of me was wrestling because I was like, Oh, prayer. What's, what's a bold prayer look like? And you know, what do I ask for? And, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I kind of didn't know what to do. So I finally almost, yeah, I mean, I, thoughts came to my mind. Like, of course, I want to see, you know, the, every every person in ministry wants to see the ministry grow because ultimately you want to see lives changed. You want to have an impact on the world. And, and that's a sweet thing. That's a gift that God gives us to be a part of his kingdom work. But I still, I, I, I just didn't have confidence and clarity on how, how to pray. So finally, I just prayed about how to pray. <laughs> I was like, Lord, I want to honor you with a bold prayer, but I can truly say, I don't know what to pray for. And to my surprise, um, I'm not even sure I was expecting to hear an answer, but I actually did. And it was a very clear answer. One of those real moments where like, you know, that the Lord really spoke to you. And he said to me, uh, pray that the Hagar Bible study would be translated into Arabic. I'm like, seriously? I mean, it just, it just, it just threw me completely. I mean, it just like, where is, I knew it was him, but I'm like, really? Like, it's not even published yet. Number one, number two, normally I hear again, the logic's already kicking in. Right. Which is just getting in the way of what God is saying. But in that moment, I was thinking like, isn't Spanish normally the next translation, right. if you're even, gonna, even if you're going to get translated, I mean, who, nobody knows me. I don't even know if the, English books are going to sell, you know, anyway. And, but God just was so clear, um, you know? And so I was like, and because he was clear, I, I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm holding on to this prayer, you know? And I shared it with my mentor at the conference and some close friends. And, you know, when I got home a few days later, I shared it with my prayer group and church and so forth, um, you know, close friends at church or whatever. And everybody was praying and, um, you know, uh, through a series of events that only God can orchestrate, um, it ended up getting translated into Arabic. There was a, uh, a publisher minister who was connected to our church, uh, who was connected to our missions pastor, who was in Egypt and Hagar was from Egypt. So like Egypt was also a kind of a key part of it, you know, and he was looking for materials for the churches and heard about that I wrote a Bible study on Hagar through a woman at my church. And I'm like, seriously, <laughs> anyway, so wow. all of God just connected everything. And there I it was, pra yeah, like barely six months after it came out in English, we had the Arabic copies and they were being, you know, uh, 
used and distributed in churches in, in Egypt and throughout the Middle East. So Wow. I don't think you even went into that detail of the the ways. I couldn't remember. Yeah, I don't think you went into all of that detail. That's incredible. And yeah. so this was an idea, like, did this just, had you thought about a translation in Arabic? Oh, no. Before? Oh, no. So this I mean, is like just literally out of the blue. Out of nowhere. I mean, I was, I would have been happy to hold the English copy in my hand. You know? I mean, I was a new <laughs> author. I, you know, it was all new to me. And like, so no, th that was the last thing I would have never even dreamed of it. Certainly yeah. not so early in ministry and certainly not Arabic. You know, that's not a common, no. like I said, it's, if you're going to translate, it's usually, so you see Spanish first, you know, um, but that God had a purpose. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. is incredible. And just to imagine what God has in store for that is exciting. Just to think yeah. that he found it important enough to just drop into your lap, this, this desire and have you pursue that and pray for that. Like, I mean, that's, that's incredible. So I, I'm excited almost, to, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, if, you know, if I hadn't asked for him to give me a bold prayer, I don't know if that ever would have happened. You know yeah. what I mean? It certainly wouldn't have hit my radar. Yeah. Well, I love what you talk about there because, um, Alana, my co-host and I will talk about, um, we call it preliminary prayer or the prayer before the prayer. Like, don't be afraid to go into prayer acknowledging to God that you don't know how to pray. I mean, it's so yes. basic and kind of meta and weird, but I love that you had the humility and just the self-awareness to be like, I, I'm not sure. I don't know how to pray a bold <laughs> prayer, but God, you sure do. So, but what, I mean, when we put ourselves aside and it's like this, isn't it? With every element of our faith, when we take self out of the equation and we take pride out of the equation, I mean, the sky's the limit. God can yeah. do anything. So they, yeah. I think those prayers are so powerful. Um, and I would love for you to just talk a little bit about for you personally, I know it's different for everyone, but I imagine there's someone listening who's just like, okay, so you heard this from God. Like, what does that mean? I've never heard from God. I don't know. How do I know it's God? How do mm. I know it's not me? Um, what is, so could you just go into some of kind of for you personally, what that looks like to not just pray and give a one-sided conversation to God, but also expect and receive something back? That's a great question. So um, a little bit of a background. I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't even raised to believe in God. I, I became a Christian at 30. Um, so I was an adult. Um, and so I have a very clear you know, picture in my mind before and after. Um, and I would say in the beginning of my relationship with the Lord, um, I only knew to, you know, read God's word. Like I knew God, you know, I was, I was taught, you know, God's word is the truth. And so reading God's word and meditating and, and trying to memorize some verses and so forth, slowly beginning to learn who God is. Um, and through that, um, yeah, because in the beginning, you know, I, as a baby believer, especially it's, you know, there, you know, it's almost like going to daddy and like, I need this and I need that and I need help. And, you know, and it kind of those basic level prayers, you know, um, and then growing closer to the Lord and learning who, who he is and what his heart is praying for things that are on his heart, you know, um, for harvest of souls, for salvation, for, for justice, for truth, and just, just all the good things. Um, and you can, you, you just, it, it's a, it's a slow, long process. Um, and I would say, I, I guess, sorry, to, sorry, I'm kind of giving you a long answer. Maybe I should give the short answer first and then before the long one, but long answers um, are okay. <laughs> okay. God bless you. Well, um, uh, yeah, I tend to be a little worried sometimes, but, um, because I'm so detailed, <laughs> but I feel like, you know, God, he reveals himself to us at the level he knows that we can understand him. Um, so in, as we're baby Christians, it's gonna be a, a, a different level. And then as we get to know truly who God is through his word, um, we come to know him on different levels. And He, I believe he speaks to us then on those different levels. And I would say that when you're unsure whether you're hearing from God, you always wanna go back to the word because you, you've got the word in front of you. You literally have the words written in front and you can 
ask the Lord to lead your time in that prayer and help guide you in your decisions or whatever it is. And then when it, then there comes a time when you realize you've been walking with the Lord long enough, like sort of like any relationship, like a marriage relationship or a close friend where you would, you, you would know that that's their voice in the sense of that's the kind of thing my friend would say, or that's the kind of thing my spouse would say, you know, their voice and you, as you mature in the faith, I believe you, you do come to um, recognizing God's voice more and more clearly. Um, there's still those moments, even now, I've been a Christian now 26 years, um, where I'm not 100% sure. I'm like, was that you or that? And when I face those questions, um, I do two things. Um, first, if it's something, it could be something like, okay, is this something that God wants me to do. And if I'm not sure, I would say to myself, is this something Satan would want me to do? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> it really does help. <laughs> um, you know, like, okay, because if it's like something that might lead someone to Christ, well, Satan doesn't want you to do that. Hmm. So if you're being prompted or feeling like there's, you're supposed that now, you know, that that's God moving you forward. Um, Sometimes it might still not be that clear. It could be a more of a benign thing. Like, am I supposed to do this or do that? But you don't know. Um, I kind of, one of those people, like I'll err on the side of caution, you know? Um, I had one time where I, where God was prompting me, we might end up actually sharing this story a little bit later, but um, where God was prompting me to, de to de delay a flight um, home one day and and there was no conceivable reason in my brain i could understand why none at all i'm like why there's no there's no reason i wasn't arguing but i was just like is this from god kind of right. a thing and i finally reached the point where i thought you know um if it's not from him what's the worst going to happen but it is right. from him i don't want to miss what he wants me to do because the the feel it was a very strong it wasn't just a vague it was a very strong like mm -hmm. it and it wouldn't go away you know, for like the whole day, like you need to cancel the flight that you made for tomorrow and move it mm -hmm. to the next day. And then in the end, there was a good reason for it, which I, we might end up sharing it in a different part of the story because it relates to something else. Um, but so there's, I mean, it, you know, there's no real clear cut. I mean, if you're not sure, go to God's word. Um, but I would say this, that if you do want to hear from God m more clearly and more, um, it's just a matter of spending more time with him, sort of like any other relationship you'll begin to recognize. And I would say another thing that's really important is to make room, um, you know, to make room to hear because God doesn't always just speak in those, you know, whenever we expect him to, or, um, but he's working in those times when we give him room to speak, even if we don't hear him, it's like, we've given him that room and that space. And it, then it might show up. I don't know the next day it'll, you'll, I'll suddenly get the right answer. Um, because somehow he had just been working in your spirit. I mean, I can't explain all the mysteries of God for sure. Um, but those are some of the experiences that I've had. Um, oh, those are great. That's great advice. And I love how you say to make room because I feel like in our, you know, modern society, for me personally, I'm almost always, I, I've almost always, I almost always have input. So I love listening to podcasts or listening to audiobooks when I'm driving, when I'm, you know, folding laundry, whatever it is, like I, I a lot of times will have input and there are certain times when I just have to be very intentional. I'm, I'm driving somewhere and no one else is in the car. And so I'm like, okay, I need to be silent for a little bit to give God room if he wants to talk to me or to give my thoughts a chance to ruminate and yes. think about things and for God to be, to invite God into the process of thinking which I think is prayer. I mean, I look at that as a form of prayer, just even thinking through something and saying, God, help me with this. And just thinking through things prayerfully. I mean, I just think that there is not enough of that because what I find is almost every time, this is how I know that I don't have enough white space in my life is almost every time I leave white space, I come to a lot of conclusions and hear, things from God, whether it's in the shower, whether it's driving the car quietly or thinking while I'm going to sleep at night. Um, so I love that reminder to make space if you want to hear back because, you know, you're not, there's no, he's not going to necessarily force himself on you if you're not 
tuning your ear to his voice. Absolutely. Think. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we, like you were saying, you know, we, we live in a culture that's, you know, very fast paced, instant results, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we, we, and if we don't, and, and making room, and then like you were saying, being intentional with that space. So, so in the car, obviously you can't be reading your Bible, but you can be me meditating on something that, you know, you've been working on with God or, or, you know, thinking about or praying for somebody or, um, but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very dangerous because we can become accustomed to kind of, you know, a verse a day keeps the devil away, <laughs> you know, and never really truly give our time to soak in God's word, um, which is how we come to know him. He gave it to us for that reason. Uh, there's no other way to come to know the Lord, um, on a deep level than to engage with him through his word. Um, that's how yeah, it's well, and I love that you bring that up too, because I think the temptation sometimes, especially when we're busy is okay. I can find time in the cracks to pray to God. I'm in the car. I can pray. I can stop and let him be involved in my thought processes, but we may not be as willing to put the work into studying God's word. And I know that I've heard people say before, well, why do I have to study God's word? Like it's there. I know what it says, but like you said, like if you don't give yourself God's word as a, as a springboard to think about and to ruminate with, you know, ruminate on with God, um, you're missing out on, uh, on a, a, a foundation of knowing who God is definitely based on his unchanging word. Um, because it can get dangerous to rely on thinking you're hearing from God when you're not connected to what his word says. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? When you can't test and approve, you know, the Bible says, um, uh, do not treat prophecies with contempt on mm -hmm. one hand, but on the other hand, the next part says, but test everything. And you're not going to test it against your heart and your feelings and your leanings and what you've heard other people say. You have to test it against God's word. And and so what a reminder to, you know, have. The, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that. Um, and I think part of the challenge, at least from people that, you know, I've, I've heard from in ministry over the years and so forth, is that, um, you know, kind of the other part of it is, you know, I want to study God's word, but I don't know how, or I've read it many times before and it doesn't feel fresh. And I think that's when, uh, you know, you end up, you know, you're longing for that deeper intimacy with God, but you don't know what to do with it. So you get frustrated and, you know, either ignore it or try to stuff it or, you know, or, um, you know, you just get frustrated. Um, and, and, and I think that's when, you know, like, I think there's a reason why there's so many stories in the Bible, narrative stories, yeah. because we can, you know, Jesus taught in stories and parables all the time because we can remember them. We can relate to them. Um, you know, you know, the studies I write are all based on a character, a somebody's story, because I think they're just, you can connect so much more easily with a person and a story um, and stepping into their lives or trying to understand, um, you know, uh, you know, what they experienced and then coming to understand who God is through how he interacts with them. Um, we get so much out of that when we take the time to really dive in deep, uh, into someone's story. Um, you know, because, you know, the Bible wasn't written to be understand by, uh, through just verses. It, it, it wasn't written that way. Uh, except maybe the book of Proverbs. Um, and so, you know, if we, we just hold on to these verses or short passages um, without, you know, I mean, they're great. I mean, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and you were mentioning before, like these little snippets of prayers, that, that's good. You know what? God knows where we're all at. And sometimes that may be all you have. Well, he will honor it. He will honor it. So don't, you know, whoever's listening, don't take that. Through. But when you have the ability um, to make room and we, you know, we choose not to or so forth. Uh, now we're missing out. Uh, we're, we're only hurting ourselves um, because God's word truly is so, so, so rich. And when you have someone to guide you through the stories on a deeper level, you really do come away knowing God in a new way. That's why everyone in the studies I write, the subtitles is rediscovering 
the God who, in this case for Rahab, it's the God who saves me. Um, and I think it's part of it is because I didn't grow up in the church. So for me, everything was fresh and new. And so for those who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, it's like, no, you really can learn something new through these stories. There's so much in God's word. It's so rich, so rich. Yeah. Well, and likewise, um, you know, for those that are new in their faith that are just like, I've tried reading the Bible, but I don't understand it, especially some of these Old Testament stories. Um, that's a gift because it is all new and you give them a gift by presenting some of these stories in ways that are very approachable, very readable, very um, well. So you kind of uh, put yourself down earlier by saying, oh, I'm long winded and I've, you know, <laughs> I've, I've, I've used a lot of words, but that's one of your great gifts. I mean, I just in, in reading this and seeing this study, you have a very deep theological undercurrent. I mean, it's very, you've obviously been, you know, you've gone to, I don't know, did you go to Bible school or seminary? Seminary. Yeah. Seminary. Um, you have this theological background and you just have a gift for very intentionally picking out, um, you know, theological truths for taking different ideas and finding the common threads and bringing them together. So that is not something to apologize for. I love that about, <laughs> about the way that you write. And um, I'm just curious if in doing this study, um, if you like uncovered what I would consider theological gems, like you had after, after having a foundation in, in the Bible that you just come away with, Oh, I didn't realize that. That's so neat. Um, Oh gosh. Yes. I mean, for every study I write, God shows me something that's like, Whoa. So for Rahab's story, th there's a couple of things that stand out. Um, so, uh, th there's, there's, I would say three particularly that come out. One is, um, sort of the contrast between Rahab and where the Israelites are, are at in this moment of time. So in this story, and I do give a lot of um, context when I start a Bible study for those who may not be familiar with the Bible, I always present their stories within context first. So you have a really good, strong foundation and, and backstory like, okay, here now we're going to get to see how Rahab's story fits in the Bible, in the God story, you know? And so in Rahab's case, you know, you have the Israelites who are, um, you know, they're on their way to enter the promised land, finally, after 400 years of slavery and then wandering in the desert and so forth. Um, we come to the um, uh, uh, the end of the Exodus, you know, and, 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 these, and this, they're on the edge of the promised land. Um, and the Bible tells us that they are camped uh, in a town called Shittim, just on the other side of the Jordan River. And on the opposite side of the Jordan River is the city of Jericho, where Rahab is living as a prostitute. And the city of Jericho is marked by God for destruction. Okay. And so you have the Israelites camped on the other side of the Jordan, waiting for the moment when they're going to be crossing the Jordan River in, in, and entering the promised land, an event they've been waiting for for, for generations. Uh, and God... Uh, puts the entire drama on hold to tell us all about Rahab, this prostitute. So right, right there, just in that aspect, it's very a profound theologically because this is the entrance to the promised land. This is what the people have been waiting for and dreaming of for generations. And God's going to put the whole thing on hold to tell us about this one prostitute. You know, so from like a human standpoint, it's like, why? You know, and, and, and the beauty of the story is the why. Because God cares about this one prostitute. Because, okay, remember I mentioned that the, the Israelites are camped at this town called Shittim on the other side of the Jordan. Well, what most people might not remember about the story is at that point in time, uh, the book of Numbers tells us that the Israelites begin to sacrifice to demons. And that's probably shocking to anybody that's listening to it, but you can look it up uh, in the book of Numbers. Uh, and th they're, they're, they, they begin to what it's called the whore with the daughters of Moab. I think it's chapter 25, I think it is. But um, anyway, and so here they are camped on the edge of the promised land and God's people are turning away to sacrifice to demons, false gods. And then on the other side of the Jordan River in this wicked pagan city, 
a prostitute's coming to faith in God. It's like, what? You know, the contrast right there is to me just, I mean, it gives me, it gives me goosebumps. Like, yeah, I just think that's too. so exciting. Um, yeah. And so that's, you know, kind of, kind of two of the pieces that come, uh, two of the three that come to mind when I think about Rahab's story and the profound, you know, theological significance of it, because that God would interrupt the conquest story, you know, to save Rahab is really a story. It's not an interruption. It's an intervention. God's going to go in and rescue this woman because of her faith. Um, and you know, gosh, I could spend all day talking about that. Well, you've got the book, but, but there is one more piece I will just at least mention just to, just to get, uh, those who are listening, um, you know, perhaps excited about exploring her story, but there are also this, I didn't expect when I was reading the this, this study. I mean, God always shows me something new, but there are more than a dozen specifically clear parallels between the events in the book of Joshua, where Rahab's story appears and the events in the book of Revelation, which has the story of the most vile prostitute of all. Um, and, and then so there's this com complete contrast, you know, where one prostitute in, uh, you know, Rahab, you know, she turns and becomes, you know, a child of God. And then in this Revelation, you have the epitome of pure evil, you know, pure depravity, no hope, you know, there, you know, and but the parallels between those events uh, and the story of Joshua, and there's just so many um, that I bring about in the Bible study because it gives us another element of understanding how theologically important Rahab's story truly is in revealing to us God's heart for salvation for anyone that turns to him, makes no difference what they've done, makes no difference who they are. Um, he, he, will, he will respond. Uh, to those who love him. Um, and yet at the same time, you have the story of the Israelites who are, you know, you know, they're, I hate to say they were falling away, but they were, they were surely stumbling, <laughs> um, you know, but God didn't abandon them either. And um, I, I just love that about, about our God is he's so gracious and gentle, um, but yet he is also holy and can, cannot tolerate sin. Um, and, uh, but he will receive anyone that comes to him. So those are just, and those are just tiny highlights. I really didn't get to go into deep because we don't have enough time, but um, those are a few of the things that come out. Uh, that come is exciting. Mind. Oh, that yeah. is so exciting. And I just love that contrast, how the Bible does that, you know, between Israel falling away and Rahab, you know, in her depraved profession coming yeah. to God. And then like the prostitute imagery in Revelation and in her story, like that is, I, I really love to see those big picture things. And again, if we either don't have the background, most of us, I would say, as we read the Bible, don't necessarily come to those conclusions. So this is what I love about studies like this by people like you, is that we can basically, God has given you the gift of, of discerning these things and compiling them in a way and highlighting things so that we can appreciate these beautiful nuances and, and appreciate the bigger picture story. Um, so anyway, thank you for, for putting, because I know it takes a lot of time and a lot of study. It's not just writing these words on a page, the research that goes into it, the time. I mean, that's, that's definitely, um, it's a lot. So I just thank you for yeah. putting that time in and, oh, you know, oh. being able to, come out with with something like this that is so readable and so relatable to people. I so appreciate that. I mean, that is my prayer. I mean, I write these studies with the intent of really inviting readers to kind of walk that journey of exploration with me. So, you know, I write my studies intentionally in a way where the readers can, you know, I, I provide sort of the guardrails, mm -hmm. you know, as a teacher and in protection, but I want it written in a way where the readers can actually engage with the tech, the texts themselves to see these things that I'm, that I, that I discovered. I want them to truly feel like they're discovering it and seeing, I don't want to just tell people like, here's what, here's what right. it is. I want to write it. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons why the studies, um, many people find them appealing is because you really do feel like you're 
you're on this journey of discovery, God, in a new way. And um, so that, that just delights me, delights me, because I still love discovering what God teaches me. I, I find delight and joy in studying his word. So I wanted to share that. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, what would you say if you could pick one, one big takeaway? I'm I, there, I know there are many, but if, if you could just pick one takeaway that, that women reading this book would, would bring with them, what would you love Ooh. for it to be? If, if you could pick one. <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, mm, I would say that the beauty of the, her the Rahab story specifically is that no matter what you've done, no matter what is in your past, God will still pursue you. His heart is for you. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's hard for us to kind of accept the idea that we, before we know Christ, we were the prostitute. Right. We are the prostitute. We are the prostitute who becomes the bride of Christ. Um, that truly is our story. And Rahab's story um, is a journey of discovering that truth about ourselves. And it's really a beautiful truth um, because, you know, we need, we need to know that no matter what we've done, um, our God is still for us and our God still loves us. Um, no matter what we've done, he is ready to embrace us. Um, yeah, I, it, I, it's just a beautiful reflection of God's heart for people, for broken people, um, who've made mistakes. Um, and just no matter where you are, that he will receive you. Um, yeah, it's really our story. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Mm. Well, we are kind of running out of time, but I would love for you to let us know where can where can we find you online and connect with you and find you on social media and find out more about your books. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, I always joke that because my name is hard to spell or pronounce or remember, <laughs> although you did great. But I mean, you know, it's like Shani and Rishi had, where do we begin? So I've made it easy. If you actually just go to RahabBibleStudy.com, all one word. That'll get you straight to my website. And there Great. you can sign up for all kinds of free resources. Um, there's actually quite a bit of free voices, free voice, free resources that you will enjoy uh, if you get on the email list. I share a Sabbath tips, you know, tips for a Sabbath date with Jesus, I call it, um, and, and a whole variety of other things. Um, so I hope you'll join me there. And yeah, and Facebook too. The connections are all on my website. Unless you can spell my name. <laughs> We will link to it. We'll show everyone Yay. how to spell your name. And yeah, but Yay. even if you can't, there's the Rahab Bible study.com. So we'll get it. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you, Shadia. Thank you so much for coming oh. and being on the podcast. And how can we pray for you today? I'm going to close us out in prayer. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, gosh, I would say right now I'm kind of just beginning the um, Rahab video production uh, series. So that's a big job. Uh, it's a, it's a three month process and I just started it last week. So, um, just prayers that God would, um, use the videos to, to bless them, those who, 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 um, who see them. And, uh, one of the things I ask for often is for my voice would hold up. I do have challenges with my, with losing my voice. I've lost my voice in the past. Um, and so just all those kinds of things, technology, you know, all the stuff. Um, all but right. that's that's what I've got going on right now. I appreciate your prayers. All right. Well, we will do that. Well, Shadia, thank you for being here. And I just, yeah, can't wait for people to get a hold of these books. I've gotten to read Rahab, but I'm going to go back and get some of the others because I just love the way you write and um, just appreciate you. So thank you. Oh, thank you for having me so much. Thank you. Well, let's pray. God, thank you so much for bringing Shadia here to share about this book and just her whole series. Um, thank you for gifting her with just the gift of teaching, the gift of um, insight and discernment into scripture. And I just pray that you would continue to fill her with your spirit, fill her with inspiration and creativity and, and just allow her to 
keep going forward and in, in working for you and for your glory. We just pray that you would open doors for her for this book for the whole series and um, including this video series that she's working on. God, we just pray that you would just help her to feel um, equipped to do this, help her not to be anxious or, or feel frazzled, or I just pray you would stretch her time as she kind of juggles all the different things that she has going on right now so that this video series would just be um, a joy that she would be able to sense your Holy Spirit just anointing that time and setting it apart, that every word she speaks, every topic she talks on would be absolutely, totally from you and that she would be able to do with these videos just more than she ever could have imagined, that she'll look back on them and just wonder at all of the things that you had done as she walked in obedience. We just pray for her schedule that you would um, just allow her to manage it and um, give her the courage to say no to things that aren't your divine appointments for her, that aren't in your best for her, that you would give her the courage to say yes to things that are from you that might seem out of her comfort zone or difficult or, um, and that she would just have, just hear clearly your voice and know that it's you speaking to her. And we pray for her voice. We just pray, God, that you would sustain her. And we just know that you're the great physician. You're the great provider of everything that we need, whether it's uh, giving her wisdom to know how to take care of her voice and, and specific things she can do to preserve her voice, or whether it's supernaturally coming in and equipping her in the middle of laryngitis to be able to give a talk or do a video. Um, Whatever it is, Lord, provide for her. Allow her to get the things done that need to be done. And, and let it be known that you are the source of everything in her life. All of the victories, all of the gifts, all of the good things um, that they've come from you. And we just pray your abundant blessing on Shadia, on her ministry, on her, her writing and speaking. And thank you so much for using her to bring glory to yourself and to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jamie. Oh, my goodness. Thank you.